Hello again. This is the third of three mini lectures on undertaking correctness review. It follows mini lectures on the choice of standard of review and on conducting reasonableness review, but it will be shorter than those mini lectures. By way of revision, we have seen how, after the case of Vavilov, there is now a presumption of reasonableness review. But we have also seen how there are two situations in which that presumption can be rebutted. The first is where Parliament or a provincial legislature has indicated that the higher correctness standard of review should be pertain. And we saw that, controversially, the decision in Vavilov opens up the gate to expanded correctness review, as the majority put it, because the existence of an appeal mechanism in a regulatory or administrative statute is now taken as a legislative direction to apply correctness review. The second category of situation where correctness review is required is where the rule of law requires it. These issues were discussed in my lecture on the standard of review. So if you're watching this and that isn't ringing any bells for you, you should go back and watch that video and then come back to this mini lecture. In Vavilov, as you know, the majority provided substantial new guidance on performing reasonableness review. By contrast, the majority had almost nothing to say about performing correctness review. And what little that it did say really just confirms existing case law. This might well come as a relief because it means that the law that can be found in the textbook is still reliable on conducting correctness review. And that is another reason why I am speaking more briefly on this topic. I argued in a previous mini lecture that one of the justifications for reasonableness review was traditionally found in the idea that administrative statutes bristle with ambiguity, as Chief Justice Laskin put it in QP. Such statutes defied the assumption that questions of law have one right answer. So it might not surprise you to discover that in correctness view, the job of the reviewing court is to search for the correct answer. And where the reviewing court reaches a different view as to the correct interpretation of the law to that of the administrative agency, it is the duty of the reviewing court to correct what is, by implication, an error on the part of the agency. Accordingly, it is not appropriate for the reviewing court to show deference here is how the majority put it in Dunsmuir at paragraph 50. A reviewing court will not show deference to the decision maker's reasoning process. It will rather undertake its own analysis of the question. The analysis will bring the court to decide whether it agrees with the determination of the decision maker. If not, the court will substitute its own view and provide the correct answer. From the outset, the court must ask whether the tribunal's decision was correct. That understanding of what is entailed by correctness review was essentially confirmed in Vavilov. I say essentially because really the issue wasn't really considered. Insofar as co conducting correctness review was considered in Vavilov, it was really done so by way of a foil by which the majority contrasts its new guidance on correctness review. So in the remainder of this mini lecture, I will take you through an example of correctness review so that you can see in practice what correctness review entails. I'm following the textbook quite closely here, as you will see. And like the textbook, I will illustrate this with the case of Pushpanathan. You have come across this case before when we considered what the standard of review required in the pragmatic and functional era. You may remember that the Minister of Immigration, or rather in practice, the officials of the Convention Refugee Determination Division within the Ministry of Immigration and Citizenship, refused Pushpanathan's application for asylum. Pushpanathan had been convicted of trafficking drugs 
And, his, and the refusal was based on a determination that he had been guilty of acts contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. That was a phrase contained in Canada's immigration legislation. So how did the Supreme Court of Canada approach its decision as to whether, as a matter of law, trafficking narcotics was contrary to the principles and purposes of the UN? Well, in the first place, it looked up to the legislative history of the Canadian immigration statute. And it discovered on its inquiry that the phrase was transposed into Canadian law from Article 1FC of the United Nations Convention relating to the status of refugees. In other words, it was directly incorporating international law. So the Supreme Court of Canada and any reviewing court ought to have done the same, undertook an analysis of what this phrase, contrary to the principles and purposes of the United Nations, meant in terms of the convention. It looked to international law on interpreting convention or treaty provisions, specifically Article 31 and 32 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, this led to its conclusion, founded in Article 32 of the Vienna Convention, that where the meaning of a treaty provision is ambiguous or obscure, recourse may be made to supplementary means of interpretation, including the travel preparatoire, the preparatory works made in drafting the treaty. This is something that the Court Appeal had not done with sufficient attention. As Justice Bastarash put it, in my view, the Federal Court of Appeal erred in dismissing the objects and purposes of the treaty and in according virtually no weight to the indications provided in the travel preparatoire. I think this captures well the differences between conducting correctness review and conducting reasonableness review, even before Vavilov. The Supreme Court of Canada is forming its own judgment about the relative weight to be given to different factors, like preparatory materials, rather than asking whether the decision about the weight to be afforded to them is transparent, justified and reasonable. And on the basis of its review of these preparatory materials, and international law more generally, the court in Pushpanathan identified several categories of acts which could be regarded as contrary to the principles and purposes of the UN. And all of these related to the idea that people in positions of power who perpetrated serious, sustained and systematic violations of international law amounting to persecution could not then turn round and seek to benefit from the protections given to refugees when the tide of chaos and instability that they themselves had created had turned against them. So although drug trafficking was a most serious matter, and the United Nations had through treaties, declarations, and in other ways sought a coordinated international effort to combat it, Drug trafficking was not on the same scale of seriousness as the sort of serious and systematic violations of human rights that Article 1 FC of the Convention on Refugees contemplated. For those reasons, the Supreme Court of Canada overturned the decision of the Court of Appeal and by extension the decision of the Convention Refugee Determination Division. I hope you can see how this was in accordance with the general idea of correctness review stated in Dunsmuir, that in correctness review the reviewing court will not show deference to the primary decision maker, but will reach its decision anew, and where it disagrees with the determinations of the primary decision maker, it will substitute its own view. This last point, substitution of views, is also implicit in the remedy given. On giving its judgment in Pushpanathan, the Supreme Court of Canada remitted the matter back to the Convention Refugee Determination Division, but with the benefit of the Supreme Court's decision on what the correct position was in law. That concludes what I have to say on correctness review and with it this trio of mini-lectures on the standard of review. 
I'll see you in the next lecture when I'll be talking about review of discretionary decisions. But for the meantime, goodbye.